Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Baltimore for the fifth annual ANSWER ALS meeting. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to those uh, who are joining us via, via Facebook Live. We hope this morning will be an opportunity to learn about what the program has accomplished over the past year and that you will find it informative. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. He is the chair of the ANSWER ALS Advisory Committee and also a person living with ALS, Ed Rapp. Uh, good morning. Sir, are we on? Yeah, there we're good. Hey, it's, uh, it's great to be back. You know, uh, the realities of living with a disease like ALS is you don't take return engagements like this for granted. And um, as many of you know, there's harsh realities that come with this disease, but hidden within that are also, is also some good. Uh, you know, I had an uncle who used to say, there is no ill wind that blows so hard that it doesn't blow some good. And for me, you're a big part of that good. You know, on my journey, um, you know, I've come across some amazing doctors and researchers and clinicians and patients and caregivers that not only give me, you know, strength and inspiration, but also what you've given me is a purpose. And a big part of my purpose is called Answer ALS. And through the work you're doing, we continue to, to build momentum. And if you think about it, from inception, rolled a 1,000 patients, collected over 50,000 biosamples, more than 900 you know, genomes sequenced, and return of that information in kind of a first of its kind return of data to patients. Uh, more than 600 iPS cells leading to more than 200 motor neurons, and now the related omics that are being developed as well, stood up at what I would consider a generation one portal, started to share that data, and now 21 independent research projects that are initiated based on the data that you're creating. And probably the most important achievement to date is coming together as a very diverse group of people from 24 research institutes and eight clinical sites to work together to solve what those that have gone before us haven't been able to solve. And so I give you full marks. But in my days at CAT, when we did things right, I used to tell them it's a five minute celebration and it's back to work. Now, because we had competitors who wanted our customers and our business, you have a much more noble cause, you know, the opportunity to, to save lives. And the activities to date are all great, but it doesn't get us to our ultimate you know, definition of winning. And that's discovering the subgroups that lead to the pathways, that lead to meaningful research and ultimately a cure. And so, you know, my plea is that we don't lose sight of what the ultimate definition of winning is. And so for 2020, from an advisory board perspective, we have five key priorities. Number one is stay on top of the financials and raise the remaining funds required to finish the project. You know, on the financials, this is a complex project with a lot of moving parts and uh, we just want to stay on top of it. On raising the additional funds, at past meetings we had discussions around did we need to meter back the project to you know, line up with the timing of raising funds. And our plea was you guys execute the project and we'll raise the money. And that's what we've done. Raising more than 40 million so far of the projected 42 and a half million required to finish the project. And, and we're going to stay ahead of you. So you keep executing and we'll keep raising. Priority number two, though, is run the factory. You know, stay on the line, stay on time. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of data we've already created, but there's more to go. And the glide paths we have are designed to keep us on a pace. And if we come off the glide pass, you know, the question is how do we innovate and get back on? I think we owe it to the patient population we serve, and we owe it to the people that in, have invested in what we're doing. Number three is to build and deploy what I would call an industrial strength portal and then make it easy for the world to do business with us. You know, the, our objective is not to create data, it is to share data. 
and that's only going to come through a portal. If we're going to be the source of ALS information for the research world and more, it's got to be easy to do business with, and you'll hear more about that later. Priority number four is make the world aware of the fact that we have created the largest ALS repository of data in history. To date, I think in some ways we've been a, a, a well-kept secret. And that was okay when it was all about what we were going to do in the future. The reality is now we are doing it. The data le releases have started. We've got an aggressive release schedule for the year. You know, it's not coming to a theater near you. It is at the theater. And we need to make the world aware of it. And then that leads to priority number five then is to turn internal and external resources loose to go unravel the mystery and discover the subgroups that ultimately lead to the pathways and a cure. So, as you come together here, you ought to feel really good about what you've done. And I'd say use this as an opportunity to reconnect and recommit to finish what you've started. And uh, you know, let's put an end to this thing, okay? So, from my side, I just ask you to keep pushing and uh, Trust me, I'll do the same. All right, thank you. Emily. Okay. Thank you so much, Ed. Thank you. Next, I'd like to welcome Claire Durrett to uh, come speak to us. She's going to talk to us this morning about communications and outreach. And uh, just a couple of housekeeping comments. So we are going to move through all of the speakers and accept questions and have some discussion at the end of the session. And uh, if you are listening in on Facebook and if you have a question, please just, there's a comment box at the end of the, the stream. Please put your question in there. We're monitoring it. And uh, we'll put those questions up at the end of the session and make sure that we do our best to answer them. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is so rude to have me follow Ed Rapp. I, <laughs> um, it's crazy, and we're going to be talking about communications, and nobody does that better than Ed. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about communications. We don't have enough time to talk about the exciting things that we have planned for all of our communication strategy for the next year, because Ed mentioned to you that we are the best kept secret, or many of the best kept secrets in ALS research, because it's, it's a... Uh, it's one of those things, much like ALS, that is really complex and a little bit hard to understand for most people. So we'll start with this. I'm going to quote somebody who I always thought was, this should be attributed to Ed because he says it so often. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. If I had a dollar for every time Ed Rapp said this, and he's not wrong, uh, we would be able to fund Answer ALS through 2025. <laughs> Um, and, and, and again, he's not wrong. Um, I like to call it, and not so eloquently, Charlie Brown's teacher syndrome. I've noticed that there's some people in the audience who may not even know who Charlie Brown is or have seen the Peanuts. <laughs> I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit, but if you recall, there's a teacher in that cartoon that is unintelligible. It's just wah, 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 wah. And I imagine that that's what my dogs hear when I talk to them. But I also imagine that when we talk about research and we talk about ALS research specifically, that that is probably what a lot of people hear, uh, hear from us. Um, but I do want to start by saying that the work that everybody in here is doing and the work that everybody in ALS research done is extraordinary. But it can be difficult to understand. Um, and if no one can understand the depth and the breadth of the work that you're doing and nobody hears about it, it's not meaningful to them. So like Charlie Brown's teacher, the talk of massive amounts of data, omics, genome sequencing, machine learning, can sound a little bit like gibberish. I did a talk a couple of weeks ago with people who do understand ALS, and I rambled on for about 10 minutes and explained everything about Answer ALS, and I thought I did a fantastic job, and I asked for questions, and the first question I got was, what is an omic? So you all know what omics are. Uh, it didn't occur to me that many people didn't understand that. So please keep that in mind when you're speaking to your general population. So one of the things I talked about in 28, or 2019 when we had the same meeting was talking about the data and the science in terms of the human impact and the human story. Answer ALS is a really big project. And I said earlier, it's enormously complex, just like the disease itself. That creates challenges when speaking publicly about this important work. 
A quote that I used to use, and one of my favorite quotes when I worked in, if you don't know, I was in, in political consulting for a very long time. Communication is only effective when we communicate in a way that is meaningful to the recipient and not ourselves. Politicians have a really good way of talking about all the things that are important to the world, and they have no idea what they're talking about. In your case, it's a little bit different. You deeply understand the work that you're doing, but we all need to find better ways of relaying that to the community. And by community, I mean patients, caregivers, family members, uh, the media, and of course, funding resources, people that we need to help us keep this research going. So a couple of tips that I usually, uh, that are really meaningful to me are speak in plain language. I'm from the South, so that doesn't really make sense to most people <laughs> because speaking in plain language is a little difficult for me at best. But if everybody can speak in terms that uh, people understand in a more generalized way, one of the things that Jeff said early on and Clive uh, used his analogy was that, one, that we're working towards creating biopsies in ALS, much like people do in cancer. That really resonated with me and it's made it available for us to share that information with others so that they can understand it. Not everybody understands data, for instance, so speaking in plain language. And another thing that's really been important about the Answer ALS project is what is our end goal? And talking to the media in a number of times and journalists who want to cover Answer ALS, they want to know what it is that we're trying to accomplish. We can always say we're trying to end ALS. We can always say that we're trying to solve the disease for everybody and create treatments. And explaining to them how we want to get there is enormously important, but if they don't understand all of the information leading up to it, at least they know that we're trying to do this and how. And the most important thing that should resonate with everyone that this is about lives. It's not just about the science. And in a way, we try to communicate that one life at a time. We, we talked about this a great deal uh, at the last annual meeting, but um, one of the stories that popped out in 2019 I wanted to share with you, if you're not already aware of it, I know many of you are, um, but people often say when working with those living with ALS, that they're some of the most amazing people that they've ever met. This is the good person's disease, the, the, the people who have really succeeded in life as being humans, and they're affected by ALS. We hear that story over and over and over, and many of the people that I've met in this journey with this disease have been some of the people that I cherish most in life, and I think that's probably the case for most of you in here. Um, one of those people who just arrived uh, is Peter Warlick, and the folks at American Airlines and Aviators Against ALS has been a community that I didn't expect that this aviation community would come together and really join forces with each other. And one of those stories is about a pilot who just ran into another pilot's bag at an airport, and that led down the path of telling a really uh, incredible story about how just one little act of kindness can help someone else and how that's really elevated ALS awareness in the aviation community. And this is this story. 2017 was an exciting year for me. I had just upgraded to a new captain at American Airlines. And uh, one day I was on my way to work, walking through the hallways to operations in Miami. There was a bag that caught my eye. For a bag to be stranded was very unusual. A flight bag, it's more than just a bag. You know, they're an extension of uh, who you are. Everything inside it for us to do our jobs, it's in there. I went through it, found out it was Doug Gensel's bag. I didn't know Doug, and uh, I thought, well, I'm just gonna give him a call. What ended up happening uh, was uh, it's something that changed my life. The phone went right to, uh, right to speakerphone. Hey, Doug, it's Rich Williams. I'm a captain in Miami, and uh, hey, man, I've got your bag. I couldn't understand, you know, anything he was saying. It was a few minutes later that I got an instant message. Doug said, hey, Rich, you know, thank you for trying to get my bag back to Andy, but I'd really like you to have it. I'm not going back to American Airlines anytime soon. He had ALS. It was at that moment that I knew that, you know, I had to do whatever I could to make Doug feel like he was still part of the crew. So I took Doug's advice, and 
I decided I was going to use this bag. I took the bag with me everywhere I went. I decided to start sending Doug messages and even pictures. Hey Doug, you know, I'm in Detroit or I'm in DC. So I remember finishing up recurrent training and I was walking out the doors of the flight academy and I decided, you know, what a great time, you know, to get a picture for Doug. I put his bag up on the wall and uh, took a picture of the flags in the background. Before I got to the airport, Doug had already replied. He told a story about how much he loved you know, coming to the flight academy. I didn't know it then, but you know that would be the last picture I'd share with Doug. And here he told me later on how much it meant to Doug. And it was at, uh, on that phone call, that conversation, that I learned that the email reply that he sent me, um, every letter, of every word, of every sentence that um, he would type with his eyes, with a retinal scanner. You know, it really shows you that uh, there's someone inside of each and every one of those suffering from ALS. There's so much meaning in it, you know, I mean, reaching out and grabbing the handle uh, of a bag. It's almost like with Doug, when I grabbed that bag, I was lifting and lifting him up. And like that bag, there's something valuable inside, just like each and every one of us, it's, it's worth holding on to. So that's just one story of somebody finding a bag in an airport and touching lives, and not only touching Doug's life, but his entire family and the, the aviation community. Um, that story's been told a number of times throughout the aviation community now. It was just something that was happenstance, that, was, that Rich was on stage one day, and everybody at uh, American Airlines suddenly heard this story, I think reached out to Peter, and then it, it kind of traveled like wildfire, that there were these other people who had ALS that were pilots and we needed to find these folks and uh, share the story. Um, so that story ended up being so powerful that we took it a little bit further. Uh, a bag company contacted us after we shared the story with them and said they wanted to be a part of a campaign. It wasn't a huge campaign, but it was really interesting that somebody saw the value of one bag as a representation of life. And so they started a small campaign with that Many pilots are now more engaged. Rich, as you saw in the video, is enthusiastic at best. And um, uh, Susie can probably attest to that. Rich has created about 100 campaigns since this one. And he's gotten uh, every fighter pilot in the entire world invested in Answer ALS now. But while the goal was not really for us to raise money off of this story, it ended up being powerful enough to kind of uh, the, the tide rises all ships, so to speak, and so telling the story in a number of different ways created a fundraising mechanism for Answer ALS um, that has raised a, enough money to help us keep going for some time. Um, but the mo most important message about this is that it was one life, it was one action, and that it, it took this small story in somebody's life who was a pilot who was un wasn't able to fly any longer and we continue to tell his story, and that's really important. And it's not unlike the work that you're doing. Everything that you're doing in the lab or everything that you're doing in Answer ALS, you may not realize it, but you're affecting another person's life. But just to show you the example of the, the campaign that we started with this bag company, telling the same story in a different way. This was a pilot's bag, filled 
and decided to carry it with him around the world. And as he lifted up this man's back, he lifted up this man, inspiring him to keep going, to keep fighting, forming a friendship that lasted many years. A friendship that taught him, just like our bags, there's something valuable in each of us that we can use to lift someone up. And we ran this over Thanksgiving, and we encouraged people to do something, to have an act of kindness for somebody else in the ALS world, and it had a, a pretty significant impact. So shameless plug. Um, the last time I talked to you, uh, we were a couple of months past the last gala that was in Seattle, and now we're two weeks and one day to the next one, and it's in New Orleans. Um, we would encourage those of you who are not already coming to try and be in New Orleans in two weeks and one day in probably eight hours. Um, I don't think I've slept in a week. Uh, but it's going to be incredible. We have Keegan-Michael Key. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's been in about 8,000 movies. He's uh, filming one right now with Meryl Streep. Um, he was in Keegan and Peele. He's uh, President Obama's angry interpreter from the, the, <laughs> the press event. Uh, Het Weezer is our headliner. Leon Bridges just won a Grammy for his latest album. He's amazing. John Dorenbos is an ex-NFL player who was diagnosed on his first day with the New Orleans Saints, diagnosed with a life-threatening heart disease. And he quit playing football and turned to magic. And now he's a regular on the Ellen Show and has his own digital platform and opens for Ellen. Um, and Cynthia Revo is the star of the movie Harriet. She was just nominated for an Academy Award for her song. So you hint, hint, she's probably going to sing that song at the gala. And she's also, um, she was the star of the movie Harriet and nominated as Academy Award for the song and for her film. And St. Paul and the Broken Bones is a really exciting band. The guy dresses kind of strange and wears a cape and dances all over the stage. He's a lot of fun. Uh, but the reason I wanted to show you this, other than love for all of you guys to come to New Orleans in two weeks and a day, is if you recognize the logo from a year and a half ago, it's a bunch of squares and I had a joke about researchers and squares. But it's a bunch of squares and a circle that indicates that that's the game changer. If you notice, you all have caps on your, on your tables or your chairs. And that's what the circle indicates, that you guys are game changers. Our mantra this year is live possible. Two years ago, it was together to answer ALS. And this year, it's live possible. And as game changers, we hope that you guys will go forth and help others with ALS live possible. So that's what the hat means. If anybody asks you, you can tell them that that's what you're working on. And again, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Claire. Our next speaker is Merit Sakovich from Mass General, and she's going to give us an update on the clinical progress for Mansur ALS. Oh, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, this is an amazing group of people to be working with, and uh, we really are changing the game here on ALS and working together to try to really figure out how we can understand the different biologies behind ALS and help that inform our trials much better. Um, especially for people um, following on, on Facebook, I know you've heard a lot about Answer ALS. You've also heard a lot about the Healy platform trial and Ways to Accelerate trials. And I want to point out that these things are very linked. The data that's going to be coming out of Answer ALS is going to inform us on how to pick uh, therapies better for individual people and accelerate how we can bring some of those great ideas forward uh, to patients participating in trials like the platform trial. So I'm just going to go over um, uh, the Answer ALS clinical program. Uh, many in the room here obviously are part of it and know this, but this is really for the broader community. Um, so the goal of Answer ALS is to uh, better understand the biology so we can stratify people better and to use the modern tools and technologies out there and really a, a global collaboration to try to um, figure, figure this out. So all the participants in Answer ALS, and there's been over 1,000 people who have been part of this and are part of it. Um, come to the clinics and they provide uh, in, uh, very detailed clinical information. 
Um, they also provide samples, and those samples are shared uh, in many different ways. Um, and, and some of it goes to the New York Genome to have sequenced all the genetic code and the DNA from our participants. Some of the samples go to CEDARS um, to have IPS motor neurons, or that's a way to um, look at people's individual type motor neurons. And then they go to many labs throughout uh, California and elsewhere to develop all the, um, uh, to, to understand all the things that are in your cell, all those omics that you just uh, heard about. Um, additional samples are sent to Mass General in a biobank, uh, and those are plasma samples or spinal fluid, uh, and those are also shared uh, biologically. And all of this data is linked um, so that uh, we can really characterize people um, at every level, uh, from the clinical to the cell level to the biology in their fluids. Uh, and so this is a great idea. It's not been done in ALS, and this really is the largest collection of this type of data in the field. And so the hope is when, when we look at all that data that we could pick out groups of people who have similar biology based on all these kind of uh, combined features. So the, um, the, the thousand participants were enrolled at eight centers throughout the United States, uh, and these are the sites that participated. And so uh, there's, there's over uh, two dozen groups that have worked together. We've enrolled a thousand people with ALS, a hundred people uh, without ALS at these centers. Uh, so the enrollment rate took uh, what happened over three years, and again, this is really what I call um, you know a partnership between patients and their families and the ALS community to be part of this type of critical uh, what we call biomarker or clinical research, so that we can learn from you to help uh, you, but also help all people with ALS all over the world. So this enrolled very well. People are still in the study in the, in you know follow up. Um, as I mentioned, that we're besides collecting really detailed clinical information, uh, people really donated uh, blood. Uh, some people donated spinal fluid, and uh, we have over 50,000 samples in the repository. Um, uh, mainly, that's plasma, some serum, some whole blood, and some spinal fluid. And this is a resource uh, for the entire ALS community. Uh, what uh, you know, really globally, it can have access to these samples, uh, which really an unfettered, no restrictions, uh, other than that we want, want people to be studying ALS with these samples. Uh, so the, the people who enrolled in the study um, came back for follow-up visits, and we would, at those visits, measure um, uh, outcome measures related to their illness, including measures of breathing and strength. Um, and we had some new uh, digital outcomes as well, speech, uh, ways to capture speech. And all that data is so critical for us to try to link the clinical data with all the biology data coming from the other samples. So almost uh, everybody uh, who participated in study has had their genome sequenced at New York Genome, and again, that's an open access uh, data set for all ALS researchers. So about 873 samples have been totally um, analyzed, and the rest are, are underway, either being collected or finished sampling. Um, so when we started the study, um, the, the kind of approach to be able to return results to people on their genetics wasn't quite established, you know, generally in the, in the research community. But that has changed, and so ANSWER team really felt it really important to be able to return results if people wanted on their genetic status. So a group led by Jennifer Ruckenbach at Ohio State University uh, created the whole system for this, and she presented very nicely at this at the Packard meeting a couple days ago. Uh, so it's called ROAR, which is Return of ALS Results, and this is for anyone who participated in ANSWER ALS, so that if, if you want or the participant wants to know the results of their genetic tests, they can get those results done. Uh, back to them, and it's done in a, in a good way through a genetic counselor and through the Ohio State University. So I wanted to go through this a little bit because we really want anybody who participated in ANSWER and who would like to have their results back to know about this option and to participate in it. Um, so if, if someone was part of ANSWER and they want to have their results back, what the results they can ask for back are any of the known ALS genes, as well as any of the um, now 59 what's called medically actionable um, genes. So that would be uh, genetics uh, that aren't related to ALS, for, for example, maybe breast cancer, where there is something to do about it if you knew that you had those results. And so people uh, can choose to um, have both of those or, or just one. Uh, it's really a patient-driven choice here. 
So, so far, there's uh, 645 people who are eligible for answer. 149 have opted to have the return of results. Uh, 124 of those are completed. The, the analyses are completed, and 114 results are disclosed. But, of course, this is ongoing, and uh, we want to um, uh, be able to return the results to anyone in answer who would like that. Um, so it's a simple process. It's an online consent form uh, that, and people can choose whether to have their uh, ALS genes uh, or the, the medical actional or both of those. Uh, and there's a pre and post survey just to, to really get some feedback if the approach has been helpful. So this is how people would uh, go and, and, and sign, enroll online. Uh, people can also ask their investigators and their doctors at their sites that they enrolled in about how to do it. And they, uh, even at the center, they can help you or you can do it from your home. Um, so I, we hope this is helpful. This is now a role model for how to return genetic results in all studies that, uh, where uh, DNA is collected. So um, I, I'm thankful again for the Ohio State team for putting this together and being a role model for all of ALS clinical research. So it, it takes a village to do this kind of work. There's a lot of people at the centers, but most important, it really takes the families and the patients who are part of this study to make it uh, a reality. So thank you. Thank you, Merit. Our uh, next speaker is Clive Svensson from Cedar sinai Medical Center, and the title of his talk is IPSC Line, a Motor Neuron Generation, Updates, Single Cell Analysis, and Chips. Okay, thanks very much, Merit. Keeping in spirit. How do I look? This one. Okay, uh, very, uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, great to see Ed and Peter. Uh, really, uh, we are, I feel, somewhat in the engine room, uh, producing the IPS lines uh, and differentiating them. And what I'd like to go through today is <clears throat> a brief overview of our progress first, and then <clears throat> perhaps some thoughts about where this can go uh, with a little bit more uh, science behind it after we complete the initial uh, run of this, uh, this program. So this is the way it works. Uh, we have cells that come in. Uh, from here, from uh, around the clinics that Merritt just discussed. Uh, at, at the uh, IPS core at Cedar sinai we isolate what's called PBMCs, which are the uh, blood cells that we use then to generate uh, the, uh, blood, the IPSC cells. It's a 90-day process, three months, to make the cells. Some of the people, Lindsay, is in the audience who actually do this, and I'll mention that again in a moment. Once we have the iPSCs, they're frozen down in batches. Uh, around 20 vials are frozen. Uh, the beauty of this is that those, I, those iPSC cells uh, are available for other people to use. So this is not the end of the project when we make them. They become available, and I'll get, that, get to that in a moment. And then part of, I think the most challenging part for us was this part where we, we've now got the iPSCs. So this is your biopsy, if you like, of the patient. But it doesn't mean anything until you turn them into the motor neurons that die in the disease. And that was the most challenging part. Uh, we now have a protocol that takes around 35 days <clears throat> or a month to do that. Uh, if you add on sort of time for growth of the iPSC first, it's about 42 days. Uh, this process uh, now is, is remarkably robust. Uh, we've, we're very happy with the process. Um, and after we then uh, get to this point, it's about 90 days to do the analysis. So that's the overview. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about flight paths, and Peter really, <laughs> American Airlines really put us on this track uh, and, the, and the board. Um, this is our original uh, uh, approach to getting the PBMCs, and as you just heard from Merritt, we've now collected over 1,000, 1,031 from all the clinics. The PBMCs uh, have been uh, complete, uh, uh, successfully made from the blood cells that we receive uh, from all the clinics, so those PBMCs are made and frozen. And then we have to convert them into IPS. So here's one of the first flight paths. Uh, now, you can't see the numbers are too small. In green is where we are today. So we're at around 629 uh, lines that have been initiated from the 1,000 that we've received. The orange is where we initially made our predictions to get to the 1,000 lines. Uh, you can't see the date. It's, uh, first, uh, here is the 1st of April, <laughs> April Fool's Day, <laughs> 2022. I'm not sure if that's on purpose, um, where we get to the full 1,000, in fact, just over 1,000. And what we really want to do is shift this curve, obviously. Uh, and, and, you know, we rather this was sort of rather like the uh, spread of coronavirus going up like that rather than, rather than parallel. Um, we're trying as hard as we can to improve this and increase this curve. 
Um, there, are, there are capacity issues, there are space issues, and we think we may have uh, got some way to helping with that, as I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, but at the moment, this is, this is our projection for the production of the lines uh, over the next couple of years. And I'll, I'll, again, tell you how we're trying to make that more efficient in a moment. <clears throat> this is the uh, sort of blow up of the IPS lines. Initiating and completing are not the same thing. You can initiate a line, and it might fail for a number of different reasons. We didn't make the IPS line completely uh, correctly. Uh, in terms of it has a bad phenotype, something's wrong, I have to go back and try and remake it again. I shouldn't say we didn't make it correctly. The line didn't uh, have the phenotypes that we were interested in uh, for stability, et cetera. So when you actually look at the number of lines uh, we've, we've now got through to complete it and have passed the test, uh, we're about 619. And again, that line will go up to the uh, 1st of April, 2022, uh, along the current track. On the differentiation update, <clears throat> we take the IPS cells to make our brain biopsy. We have to differentiate the cells, turn them into uh, the motor neurons that die in ALS. Through, uh, this is Drew Serene that developed this protocol uh, through the different stages, 32 days, and they look like this. Uh, this kind of, you get these uh, aggregates of cells which are actually okay, they contain lots of motor neurons, and these little patches, they, they actually communicate with each other through channels, and we think there are axons and communication going on within these complex cultures. Uh, but this is the day 32 culture that we then separate in, these, uh, in this way uh, into different groups, uh, all from one set of lines, eight plates from one patient. And this is where we hand over to the next team that you're going to hear about from a moment, uh, where we freeze down for mass spec, RNA-seq, and attack-seq. And you'll hear a lot about this from Leslie in a moment. Uh, and this process looks quite simple on this chart, but it took a long time to set this up. So that what's nice is when you see the data, the RNA-seq is from exactly the same sample that the protein came from, which is exactly the same sample as the attack-seq is done on. So all of this is together as it's the same as the clinical trial data we have from the patient and the same uh, genome data that we have from the patient as well. <clears throat> this is our uh, flight plan for production of motor neurons. You can see so we have a long way to go. Uh, we are here. I'll zoom in on that. Um, but we are keeping exactly to our timeline uh, for motor neuron production. The batches are going out to the different programs. Uh, and so I think on, on the whole, we're, we've been incredibly successful. We've met all our milestones and goals uh, as we go forward uh, for this. And I'm going to give a teaser for Drew Serene. Uh, he's going to dive into this data uh, this afternoon or later on today. Just a teaser. We can all, already get a lot of information. Most studies actually stop at the point where you look at the motor neurons after 32 days and you analyze them for immunocytochemistry to see what's in there, what motor neurons are in there. And I can tell you that we use six, a batch of six markers. This, again, is all Drew and the, and the cores work. Uh, and ILOT1 is a classic motor neuron marker. If, you, if a motor neuron has to express that at the beginning of its development, and we have a hint here that, remarkably, in ALS, it's slightly higher. And this is not what we expected. <laughs> um, but the ILOT1 is coming out slightly higher. Uh, and you'll see here that this is genders combined. There are two genders, and that's, uh, there's male and female. <laughs> uh, and you're going to hear a little bit about that as we move through the day, but that turns out to be important. Uh, and Drew, again, will dive into this data later on. But we are assembling a lot of data. And you can see there are, there are different types of uh, cultures. Some have more islet and some have less. And we're going to use that information to correlate with some of the, clinic, the uh, both the clinical data, but also uh, the omics data further down, proteomics data, et cetera, because it's going to be a useful indication of what that culture contained at the time we passed it on to our other collaborators to do the other assays. So all of this is uh, being collected. This is for you, Ed. Uh, and Peter, could we go faster? Uh, you know, uh, we're always trying. Um, one of the things that's happened very recently is uh, we, we ran out of space. We physically couldn't squeeze any more people into Lindsay's core. You go past her room there where she's producing the cells, and there are like 20 people tie into a room half the size of this, I'd say a quarter the size of this, uh, so uh, maybe a tenth the size of this. Um, and so we've developed, close to see the Sinai, we've leased space now to push out the IPS core. Uh, and it's now uh, an amazing uh, facility. It's in a design center in Los Angeles. So we were forced to use really cool designs everywhere, which was fine. Um, and when I managed to get the space here, the, the owner, Chuck Cohen, I said, well, we don't do medical stuff, Clyde. We can't do anything. And I said, well, we do exactly what you guys did. He said, what do you mean? So well, we do designer cells. <laughs> as soon as I said that, I had him. Uh, and we had 40,000 square foot of space. Uh, we just recently got another 60,000 square foot in the same building for an innovation center, which Cedars is launching. 
Uh, and so this whole area now is very dynamic, and we've moved our graduate school into space next door. So it's called, it's called our campus to the north. If you ever come to see this, you'll see why. So it's a bit like Game of Thrones. We're the north, you know. Uh, but of course, we've got to kiss the ring of the south uh, down in the hospital. But uh, it's only 10-minute walk, which in LA is forever. <laughs> People are trying to drive, and I'm like, no, it's seven and a half minutes to walk. I said, Clive, I need to take my car. No, that's right. I love LA. Uh, this is inside. You can see uh, all glass through so we can see what's going on. Um, between the labs, uh, we also have a CGMP uh, manufacturing facility in this building as well. Very importantly, the repository, you can go in and you can order these cells. Uh, we do cost recovery to uh, a, a charge to get the cells, but we're not making any profit. It's just so we can renew that cell after it's gone out. So if you go have a look at the repository, uh, we have over, uh, I, I can't go back. How can I go back? He said, don't push the red button, whatever you do. OK. Um, and so once you order the line, uh, it'll be shipped to you by our fantastic team. Uh, and then you can do your own work. And you could actually pick your, tw your 50 favorite lines from the database, go in and order them, and they will be arriving in your lab uh, within, within two days. No, I won't say two days. Uh, however long it takes to do the MTAs and the uh, paperwork associated with it. Um, so we have 52 control lines, 32 C9 off, uh, 302 sporadic, 11 SOD1, and these other ones, uh, more rare mutations down here. We are adding them to the website as we produce them. Uh, it's an easy checkout process. And, and we're going to be linking these to, to the ALS portal you'll hear about more today. We've already distributed these lines uh, around the world uh, to many different locations. And just, I didn't want to go through, and this is just a part of the... Uh, list of people who've requested lines from our repository. We're handing all this data over to Terry and, and Jeff and everybody so they can see uh, who's requesting. Uh, but we have some uh, interesting companies like Vertex uh, requesting lines. And again, they all seem to be happy with our MTAs. That We've left it very open so they can do anything they want with them. Um, they just can't sell them on to another second party uh, because that would infringe the IRB issues that we have. Now remember, these are human cells coming from patients. So we have to maintain some uh, uh, control over the cells from our IRB perspective and the initial IRB that, that Merit put together. So it's not just like handing out a Cho cell. Uh, these are cells att attached to humans. So we're being somewhat uh, very careful with this data, but we are making it as accessible to everybody as possible, rather like the data use agreements that Jeff and I uh, sign and sign off on for people to use. And again, I, I'm up here, but this is the amazing team uh, that has been doing all this work. And I'll point out Lindsay here, who, who's in the audience, who really has uh, been started making all the, all the lines. And, and Aaron, who, who uh, has just amazing uh, controlling the differentiation and the team that's doing the differentiation, who's also here sitting next to Lindsay. I just want to bring out some new ideas the last few minutes. Uh, I think we can reduce the amount of protein. Uh, that would speed things up. And this would allow us now to develop uh, these induced motor neuron cultures. We can take them at day 12 and take out a sample set that could be used by Steve and others for doing other things. So we're hoping to make more plasticity so we have some cells frozen down at different stages. We probably want to validate soon some runs, so rerun some lines and see if they came out the same as they did the first time. This is a classic validation set that we're all talking about. Um, and one other thing I want to point out as we go forward into the day is we didn't see an, an, a, an immediate signature. It didn't pop out like we would, maybe would have hoped. We're having to look more detail, do more lines. And it might be that ALS is not just in the genome. This is a hypothesis. It could be that you need to bring it out with a stressor. And so some ideas we have is glutamate or growth factor withdrawal, which others have used, to bring out a phenotype that would not affect the control line, but would affect the ALS line. And again, this is uh, part of the follow-on studies that are going to go. I, I feel like as we get more lines, we will start seeing subgroups coming out. But at this early stage, it may be we can run some uh, phenotypic assays. So in the last three minutes that I have, I'll update you a little bit on two things that could follow on from, from this database and that we've already started uh, using the answer lines. And the first is that, as you can see, this is a very complex dish here that we're analyzing. And we take all these cells and we end up with one proteomics number or omics number on this complex line of cells. So we'd like to know more about what's inside the individual cells within these cultures. And Richie Ho is also here. <clears throat> I won't go through his data in detail. He's about to submit this now. It's been a long, long, long paper <laughs> coming together. But he took uh, a whole set of lines, different lines shown here. And when he did single cell transcriptomic analysis, he could actually group that cluster I just showed you into, into different areas. So for instance, this cluster here are the motor neurons. 
uh, outside. So if you go back to the, this picture, he's managed to find just these motor neurons and take them out and analyze them independently. And when you analyze them independently, the motor neurons seem to have more differentially expressed genes. So when you just look at the motor neurons and take everything else away, we start to see a better signature. And he's picked five or six genes from this set, run it through a program, comparing with the data sets out there. And he can actually use those genes to accurately identify an ALS versus non-ALS sample in a data set from the literature. So this is very exciting and I think should lead to some more clues as to what's going on. We're doing a pilot study uh, in, in the lab just to see if we can take the 32-day motor neurons and do single-cell RNA-seq. Uh, there's two methods for this now. One is whole cell, and the other is using the single nuclei. When you dissociate whole cells, they rip apart. But if you get their nucleus, the brain of the cell, and put it through the single cell, it gives you a cleaner signal of all the cell types that are in your culture. So we're comparing uh, both single cell with nuclei or single cell whole cell. Um, and a couple of different methods of getting the cells off. Uh, this is an ongoing experiment. Uh, the RINs look good, and that's going to be uh, going ahead. Uh, we have some data from that very shortly, maybe within as soon as two weeks, to see if we can even do this. Uh, and then we can, with Leslie, start maybe putting this into our pipeline. But we'll see. This is just a pilot. And then finally, this uh, uh, National Geographic covered this uh, the beginning of last, this year, last year. Uh, these are the microfluidic chips that we've been seeding these cells into. Getting more physiological is going to be important. Um, uh, we've now found that we can seed these into chips successfully. When we put flow, the brain has flow going through it for the CSF blood flow. When we put flow on these channels, you can see this is a static culture cross-section through a chip. You get a few neurons in the top here in this cross-section. When you put flow through, you actually create many, many more neurons. The cells divide and form a structure uh, that sits in the chip here, and it's much more physiological, we think. Uh, and if you, uh, can now, you can now do this across a number of lines. This is ALS versus control. This is Sam Sance's work, where he's compared now five controls with five ALS. And it's kind of cool. Um, the chips themselves are quite thick, uh, you can see here. Um, but the axons through these chips run up and down in parallel. Um, and within here, you start seeing parts of the spinal cord develop. Uh, this is uh, looking at motor neuron pools within, inside the chip. And they put little projections down to the endothelial cells, which are in the bottom. So we can now actually blow, flow blood through this bottom channel with drugs in it. And you can see how the drugs interact with the neurons on top within a physiological system that is from the patient. And I think this is now a patient, ALS patient on a chip uh, that we're incredibly excited by. Uh, these cells also light up. Uh, as you can see here, we can do calcium imaging. And it's funny, this is a trend that you'll hear about today. We, we actually saw more, more activity in the ALS neurons than we saw in the control, and we see more sprouting. This seems to be something that these, these neurons, ALS neurons, are actually doing better. They're more active than control. I don't know if that's going to hold. And the beauty of this program is it's, it's hypothesis generating. We're just looking at the data and seeing what we're going to get, going with our preconceived ideas. So who knows, ALS neuro, motor neurons may start off much more active and maybe that's part of the problem. They're too active, and later on that comes back to haunt them. Last slide, um, you know, I put, we put a, actually a nice review, it's coming out tomorrow, uh, of all this technology. And one of the challenges is down here is where we are, 2D cultures, uh, which is high throughput, which is great for answer ALS. But perhaps we also want to think about chips or other organoids to get more physiological relevance, but the problem then is the throughput goes down or gets very expensive. Um, so we kind of discuss all these challenges in this review. And then finally, in another world of mine, I work on Parkinson's disease, and I know Steve does as well, and many others. And I've been doing kind of parallel mini answer Parkinson's for the last four years um, with another whole team, and we just published this recently. And I was astounded in Parkinson's where we picked young onset Parkinson's patients with no known genetic mutation, young onset Parkinson's, and looked at their IPS-derived dopamine neurons, and those are the neurons that die in Parkinson's. And we came out pretty quickly with a good phenotype. It was initially three lines, and we did 10 more. And the phenotype was an increase in synuclein, which we know is affected in Parkinson's. Uh, and then we found we could decrease that with a drug called PEP005. Uh, and so we, within one, one paper, we managed to show that a drug could target a specific market that we found, a target that we found. So I think ALS is going to be more difficult than this. And again, this is why I think we have more of a challenge. But ultimately, maybe we can find targets and markers uh, coming out of answer. So thanks very much. And I will uh, definitely say that this was a team effort with all our collaborators, and in particular, the IPS core, uh, and Drew Serene, and, and Lindsay, and Aaron, who are in the audience. Thank you very much. Really, really terrific work. Thank you so much, Clive. Okay, 
I'd like to welcome now uh, Leslie Thompson from University of California, Irvine, and she is going to talk to us about progress in omics and hopefully also explain to us what an omic is anyway. <laughs> no pressure there. Uh. Okay. Thank you very much. I figured I'd continue the tradition here. Um, yeah, so I was going to give a bit of an update on many of the omics, um, on the progress of the omics, and keeping in mind, I'm going to show a lot of slides with a lot of uh, information on them, but I'm going to try to break, break this down a bit so that it's uh, more clear. And so I did actually already have this slide of <laughs> what is omics, and looking this up uh, in, uh, you know, Wikipedia, Google, DIT, it's really the, uh, I guess you can't really see, it's the field of study of biology ending in, I think it says omics. Um, and this is just a number of different processes that, uh, oh, there we go, ending in omics. There we go. Uh, so the, the, the piece that I'm going to be referring to today are, are depicted here in this uh, slide of a sort of schematic of a cell. And these are the various types of omics that we've been assaying as part of ANSWER ALS. For, so for instance, we look at the DNA itself. So what's the structure of that DNA? Are the regions of the chromosomes that are more open or more closed? And when they're more open, that allows factors to come in and drive expression of those genes that ultimately will become a protein in that cell. So the structure of this DNA is, oops, is very, is very important and we use a tax seq that I'll go into to evaluate how that DNA structure looks. And then we use transcriptomics. Uh, you just heard a little bit about single cell transcriptomics and we use what's called bulk RNA-seq. Uh, this allows you to not only find out what genes are expressed in the DNA, I mean in the cells, so from the DNA, they're transcribed into RNAs. And there's a plethora of different types of RNAs that the cell expresses. And with this type of technology we're using, we can get at those different forms. What other alternative forms of RNAs, if they're, if they're spliced differently, so there's ways from one gene to make a number of different types of proteins from that same gene based on whether they're what's called spliced or not. Um, we then look at the protein that's produced from those RNAs, and this is the area of proteomics that we'll be getting into also, where we take a snapshot, so you have your biopsy, it becomes a particular type of cell, and then you get very deep into what's going on within that cell and what proteins are ultimately made. And these proteins in the cell are really what carry out the cell functions. And so we can get a very in-depth picture of what is driving the production of these proteins um, and how these things are regulated and hopefully then bring in clinical information, other type of information, and stratify individuals based on their in-depth bio molecular biopsies. So uh, you saw this uh, schematic from Merit, and we've been really focusing then on the omics piece of this here. And this arose originally from uh, Neuralinks, which is an NIH-funded endeavor that a number of us were a part of, and it really set the foundation for the omics piece of ANSWER ALS. Uh, we have the transcriptomics I mentioned, the RNAs at UCI, proteomics, look at proteins at CEDARS, Ernest Frankel's group at MIT for the attack seek. Um, Steve's group is looking at imaging, so to then get a broader picture of what those cells look like and integrate that with what the various omics approaches. Uh, and then um, to look at the DNA itself, so the sequence of the DNA. Are there things that we can learn from those sequences themselves that will inform how that patient is going to progress or when they have onset, et cetera? And then finally, all of this is integrated together, and you'll hear from Ernest in a little while about how um, those analyses are performed. So some of the uh, highlights from this year that we've worked very hard on for this, as you heard uh, last year, we've established this differentiation method for the day 32 um, uh, motor neurons that Clive just described. That took some time to really get established. But they have many of the phenotypes, although they don't have overt cell death, they do have things, as you'll hear from Alyssa, um, have deficits in cell structures, such as the nuclear pore complex, 
that um, replicate what happens in ALS. We've uh, lo established consistent guidelines. This is a massive effort on the part of all the labs, and Terry and Barry and Yogi and others, uh, to, to create what's called experimental metadata. So it's basically all the information about all the experiments, even just naming the lines consistently so that we and others are going to be able to track that. We've carried out uh, all these different omics on over 100 of the day 32 lines that, that, um, and controls that Clive was telling you about when they were shipped to get in parallel to the different labs, and analysis is in progress. Um, the pipelines themselves of how to transfer data from then to get it into this portal, to get it into a staging area so internally we can all look at it and then, ex and then pr provide it externally to the community. That's really being refined and um, perfected, and it has taken quite a bit of effort. Uh, things like being able to have variant calling, so the, the differences in DNA sequences, that's quite extensive amount of work to be able to do that from the whole genome sequencing, and they've developed methods to have this scalable and much more rapidly um, performed. And then, uh, emerging integration across all the data platforms, which has also been um, worked on quite extensively. So the whole process in general has been streamlined, is continuing to be streamlined, so it's more usable for the community. Just to give you a quick overview of some of the different um, omics platforms, and not to go into any detail, but the, uh, this is the Answer ALS transcriptomics platform uh, at UCI, and where we extract, take the RNA out of the cell, we make libraries around that, and then we, um, uh, we generate the sequence information from that RNA so that we know the sequence of every one of the RNAs in that cell. And this is working uh, very, very well, and we've established this pipeline, and we're always incorporating new analytic tools, and this data is now uh, readily transferable to the uh, ALS pipeline. And just to mention that one of the key things that we and everyone are focused on is the quality control of each of these assays, and happy to say that the, technically these assays are working very, very well and passing all of the QC criteria. Uh, there's an extensive data analysis pipeline that uh, Jenny and um, Brian have been working on. I'm not going to go into all of this, but as I mentioned, we can see what genes are changed, see which genes are alternatively spliced. We can start to evaluate things that might be causal in um, the process, and as I mentioned, look at how they might be alternatively spliced so that you could get two different proteins, for instance, and, and see which one predominantly is expressed. And you don't need to get into all this, but what you've heard a little bit already and you will hear more about is, so we have this bulk RNA data, this information that we have, and as you heard from Clive, it's become extremely important to now bring in these single cell approaches, at least on a subset of the lines, because the cell composition of those differentiations has become extremely important as we analyze this data and begin to generate signatures for these individual patients. And so we bring, this is called, uh, we do a process called deconvoluting the data, so you make it more you bring in all this information, simplify it so that you can get out a meaningful signature, uh, integrate that with the clinical and technical data that we have, bring in the whole genome sequencing, bring in the epigenetics, the DNA structure, and, and begin to find out, is a variant in the DNA driving a change in gene expression? We need to know those kinds of things to be able to interpret the data more readily. And so finally, we get into these modeling uh, methods where we can begin to find out what, is, what are the causal factors within this network, then we can do the things that Clive just talked about and, mo and test validation and see if you can um, modify the phenotypes or the symptoms of that biopsy. And this is just an example of some preliminary work from the RNA-seq using these kinds of approaches where already, even if we focus on C9, and these were the day 18 um, samples, we can, can start to begin to see uh, modules or groups of genes that are expressed coordinately that are matching up and informing, um, or are informed by, say, the ALS-FRS score, 
shown here, or that are starting to stratify gene expression changes along whether they're bulbar or limb predominant uh, symptoms. So it's st starting to uh, work in stratifying these individ individuals. It's the proteomics pipeline from Van Eyck Lab. And again, not to go into any detail, but uh, one of the things that occurred over the last year or so is this automated sample processing workflow that is significantly facilitated and speeded up the processing of the proteomics. Um, and again, they have extraction of the, they take out the protein, they um, have to process it, and then they can uh, put it on their sequencer. And they're just getting a new sequencer that should be in in the next two months that's going to also speed up this process quite a bit. Uh, as an update summary, uh, they now have uh, several batches of the day 32 samples. They've sequenced 139 of these and data uh, analysis is ongoing. Uh, they, and they're getting amazing data. This is just incredible data for this type of work for the proteomics where they're getting at least an average of uh, up here, 2,900 on, um, proteins that are defined unambiguously, and in the second run, 2,600. They have a few uh, samples that have to rerun, but it's below their prediction of how many would have had to be rerun. So they're actually getting much higher levels of reproducibility than, than they had predicted or, or where the samples might have to be rerun. And again, just an example, and this is uh, from the day 18 uh, data again, where what they're seeing is these beautiful interaction networks. So these are proteins that interact with each other in a cell. And in the presence of um, ALS, they're finding particular groups of pathways, so signaling pathways. This is um, how proteins are metabolized, RNA binding proteins, things like that, that are coming up as nodes or groups of proteins that um, are working together in some way in that cell that's associated with ALS. And, but one thing that's very interesting is that there's a lot of new data that's coming out. There's proteins that are not fitting within known, already known networks. And so we're, we're now able, with all these different omics approaches, to be able to learn new knowledge about how these proteins might work in a cell and how they might contribute to ALS. And um, finally, with the ATAC-seq data, this is again looking at chromatin structure. Uh, it's, um, it's now being run by diaginode and then being uh, analyzed in the Frankel lab. And so far, all the, the um, first sets, the first 102 motor neurons have passed every bit of QC metrics, as I mentioned. They're using ENCODE guidelines, which is a um, has been an ongoing database primarily used in cancer, but it's, um, it's established criteria for this type of method. And this is just showing, you can see that there is a, um, these are the motor neurons, you can see that there are different, um, these peaks that represent whether the chromatin is open or closed, and you can see differences between the motor neurons and say a cortical neuron. So again, the composition of the cells themselves are providing very important information for us as we're doing these analyses. Um, and so the, the various motifs or these peaks that are identified and what transcription, what factors might bind to these peaks to then drive transcription within a cell um, are confirming these uh, specific factors that are present only in a particular cell type. So again, this idea about the cell composition being important. And these are just a few of the transcription factors. So again, these are proteins that bind to these open regions of the chromatin and drive what genes are going to be expressed in that particular cell. And there's a number of these that are starting to emerge from uh, the epigenomics data. Um, and just to give an example, this was something that we did uh, where we took Neuralink's data and compared it to a set of answer ALS data. So there were completely different lines, completely different differentiation method. But even with those differences, we found that we can get consistency across these experiments, which is very reassuring when we're trying to do these with these different batches and, and bringing all the data together. Um, 
And this is shown here. Uh, Johnny Lee had, had put this together from Ernest Lab from data integration that you'll hear about. And all I wanted to say, show here is that there were these um, pathways that emerged as being associated with ALS. And I'm not going to get into the detail, but we even looked at whether they would be predicted to be causal or whether they might be something that the cell is doing to compensate for the presence of the C9 mutation. These are all C9 lines. And doing the second data set, doing this, all these omics, doing the data integration, it was really exciting to see if you see these little black lines. These are all changes that were consistent across both groups. So there's some type of dominant driver within the, with the C9 mutation that allows for this correlation and consistency across um, the platforms. So again, this was very reassuring for us uh, in this endeavor. And then finally, you'll hear more about the genomics, but this is uh, work going on in Steve Finkbrenner's lab and Ernest's lab to, and there, as you heard from Merritt, there's over 900 genomes that have been sequenced to date and data is being released from those. And uh, through this uh, portal, you saw the portal that Clive mentioned for the IPS lines, which are also um, uh, annotated in this, uh, in this uh, Answer ALS portal. Uh, and to date, we're really, the, the processing and the throughput uh, flight path, as you heard about, is really working very, very well at this point. We, the epigenomics, we're do processing 48 at a time, working with diagenode, 158 of those have already been sequenced. Proteomics, 50 at a time, 139 samples processed so far, um, and uh, some aspects are being uh, further uh, um, processed. Transcriptomics is 50 at a time. We've done the first set of 102. We have another 96 that are going on to the sequencer this next week. And so it's really moving along. And I think, um, you know, a lot has been uh, worked through this last year and, and really appreciate all the efforts of everyone on the various teams for all the work that's been done. So thank you very much. Great progress. Thank you so much, Leslie. Our next speaker is Ernest Frankel from MIT, also wearing his hat, and he's going to speak to us about progress with data analytics. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to tell you about is uh, how we're making use of all the data that have been gathered uh, and was described to you previously. So we know we have uh, the omics data that Leslie just described. And as Merritt described, there is clinical data that comes to us from all the various clinical sites. And then uh, has been talked about less, but there's also a phone app that uh, many of the patients are using that allows us to gather information about fine motor skills and also on voice and, uh, and potentially cognitive changes as well. And what's the goal of gathering all this data? Well, our goal is to enable the broadest possible community to make use of it to answer fundamental questions about ALS. And perhaps the most fundamental question is, how many diseases fall under that rubric of ALS? As, uh, as we've learned from cancer, trying to treat all cancers with the same drug will never work. We need to understand the subtypes of cancer, and we need, to, we need to understand the subtypes of ALS to make progress here. And then when we understand what the subtypes are, then there's potential to develop those therapeutics. And this is going to have a big impact on basic research, but also on the clinical trials. So we have a lot of data. Um, all the things you've heard about this morning have added up to about 88 terabytes of data that are already on Azure. Uh, and obviously, it differs a bit in uh, which data sets uh, produce more or less data. But if you want to get a sense of the scope of what we've already done, uh, think about this in terms of streaming movies. This would be the equivalent of three years of continuous HD streaming. So there's a lot of data already on, um, on our website. So, uh, because there is so much data, we need to think very carefully about how uh, uh, the process of getting it onto the web and then the process of people getting it off of the web if they want to analyze it offline or if they want to analyze it in the cloud. A lot of work has gone into that already. So uh, the people shown on the right, uh, Terry Thompson, Barry Landon, uh, and uh, Yogi, um, have all been working on thinking about this in great detail. And one of the things that's critical is not just the data, but the information about how the data were collected, what precise experiments were done, 
what uh, software was used to analyze them. That's called metadata. And so there's a lot of care that has to be put into gathering those data and the metadata. There are certain things that can be done automatically to make sure that the data and the metadata are high quality. Uh, but there are a lot of things that have to be done by human beings. Uh, and these three people have stepped up to do that hard work. And so now we know that when our data reaches the portal, uh, which I'll mention in, in a moment, uh, that the data are high quality and they can be interpreted uh, readily. So the portal was uh, the first version uh, was built, uh, built by Alex Linnae, uh, who did it single-handedly, and he proved the feasibility. He's given us an outline for what's then going to be turned into an industry-level um, uh, version by a team of, uh, that's being supported by Microsoft. What um, you should know about this portal is, first of all, it's a very simple path to request either data or cells. Uh, there is a button, request download data, or request cell lines. You have to go through a bit of a process that balances our uh, willingness and our desire to be as open as possible with our obligation to the patients to protect uh, their rights and their confidentiality. And so if you're a qualified researcher, you'll simply fill out this form, promise not to do anything that would violate basic uh, ethics and, and HIPAA rules. Uh, and then uh, you can go ahead and uh, through this portal, send an email to Clive's group to get cells or uh, directly download the data using the industry standard tools for downloading data. What else can you do in this portal? Well, you can take a quick look at exactly what we've done so far, how many patients we've analyzed, uh, what we know about them in terms of demographics. And uh, you can start to select patients by certain parameters. So if you're a researcher and you want to find patients who have a known C9 mutation or known SOD1 mutation, uh, you can find those here. If you want to find uh, people uh, with a certain rate of onset, um, all of that is possible through very simple controls on this website. And then you click the button and ask to get those cells from Clive's group or to download the data. There are also tools there for analysis. So not everybody needs to download the data. Not everybody wants to download the data. We're trying to increase what people can do without downloading it. So if you have a pathway or a gene that you're interested in studying and find out what does uh, the ANSWER ALS data sets say about those uh, genes or pathways, you can type those into this web portal. You can do heat maps and other kinds of standard bioinformatic approaches uh, without having to do any of the download and calculation on your own computers. And we think this will be very empowering for the broad ALS research community. We've had a lot of industrial partners that have helped. Uh, all of this uh, would not have been possible without very, very generous support from Microsoft that has given us a lot of free compute time on Azure, a lot of technical expertise, and has stepped up once again to convert the hand-built portal, uh, uh, home uh, brew version of the portal done by Alex, uh, into something uh, that will uh, withstand the rigors of hopefully thousands and thousands of people trying to download data. Um, I'll describe to you a little bit of work. Uh, we have a grant from the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab uh, that has been supporting research in my lab to make sense of these data. And then Avanad um, was very generous in helping us build tools that uh, can be used on the back end to make it easier for people to use common computational methods that they're used to using in other environments on the cloud, which can actually be uh, quite challenging. So uh, we have had a lot of uh, really great support from these companies. We have all this data. What are we doing with it? What do we want uh, to find out? Well, fundamentally, we want to ask what drives ALS. And as many of you know, the genomics, uh, the genetics of ALS are complex. In families that have a family history, we can explain roughly about two-thirds of the patients uh, in terms of what gene is causing their disease. But for the vast majority of patients, sporadic uh, occurrences of ALS, we don't know a genetic cause. So roughly 80 to 90 percent of the patients, we can't tell them this is why you have the disease. So there's a potential, obviously, since we've gathered genomic data, to find uh, new genes that influence uh, the disease. And it's important to realize there are two different kinds of genes that we might find. So often in genomics, we think about uh, how often a variant of a gene occurs in the general population and what the impact of that uh, gene is on the disease. And classic genes, Mendelian genes, that we think about when we think about genetics are ones that occur very rarely in the general population and in the disease population have a very, very significant impact. At the other end of the spectrum are things that occur commonly in the general population, and individually, they may only confer a slight increased risk of the disease. And so if you think about this in the context of ALS, the C9ORF mutation, SOD1 mutation, those are ones that by themselves cause the disease. Huge impact, and they're extremely rare in the general population. 
and presumably anyone in the general population who has that uh, variant is likely to develop the disease. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, often what we find when we look for these, non, uh, for these uh, more common variants that influence disease, uh, these are often genes, uh, sorry, variants that don't occur in genes. They occur in regions of the genome that influence which genes are turned on or turned off under particular uh, conditions. Those are called non-coding. They don't uh, encode a protein, uh, but they uh, have information about regulation. And so we hope that within the data we'll be able to discover one or the other of both kinds of variants. I should say that Steve's group, um, and Julia and Leandro, have done a lot of work uh, in this space of uh, trying to understand uh, the genomic data, and you'll hear more from them later today. So one of the things that's important to realize uh, when we understand, when we think about genomic data, is that we're looking at variants that occur anywhere in three billion bases of DNA. And so if you look at what uh, these are called Manhattan plots, which show the uh, likelihood of a variant being associated uh, with disease across the genome, so on the x-axis is the whole genome, and on the y-axis is statistical significance, usually the line that's drawn um, of the, the difference between significant and insignificant variants is at a ridiculously tight uh, statistical level. So 10 to the negative 10th is not unreasonable in these studies. And why is that? It's because you have 3 billion bases, and by chance there are going to be lots of variations that would randomly occur that would correlate with whatever you're looking at, whether it's ALS or not. And so when we scan across the whole genome, our power to detect changes is much reduced. So what can you do about that? Well, Maybe we could shrink the genome. And what do I mean by that? There are lots of regions of the genome that we know are going to be more interesting than others. So obviously, coding regions are more interesting, and we could look at those. But also these regulatory regions, the places that decide whether a gene is turned on or off, off in specific conditions are very interesting. And so the, uh, one of the things that Johnny Lee and my group has been doing is taking the ATAC-seq data, the epigenomic data that Leslie described that helps us find these regulatory regions, and use that information, which is often displayed, as shown on the right here, as peaks, where there's a lot of information from the sequencing of the ATAC-seq data. These are sites where there's probably some regulatory protein that binds. If instead of looking across the whole genome, we focus our analysis on the search there, we have improved statistical power. And so we started to do this to look at uh, reanalysis of existing SNP data. Maybe we can find out something about those, some of those variants that previous studies have found that were not statistically significant, but maybe if you focus only on these regulatory regions, they are. We can look at uh, whether there are new genetic variants uh, that were not previously detected that are associated with disease there. And then we can look for regulatory variants that may not uh, be associated with disease, not disease, but may be associated with transcriptional changes within our population and find uh, mutations, variants, I should say, that are associated with those regulatory changes. So just to give you a sense of what you might see in something like this, here's an example of something that Johnny found. Uh, on the, uh, the green, the yellow, and the blue curves show the epigenetic data. And they're from patients who have either um, a wild type, I'm sorry, a common allele on both, copy, uh, both chromosomes of, uh, of this region, or have a variant in one chromosome or a variant in both chromosomes. And what you find is that when they have a specific variant in both chromosomes, they have no open chromatin here. The chromatin is closed. When they have one variant, it's intermediate, and when they have uh, the two, then it's open. And so we can see a direct impact of these variants, which interrupt a binding site for a particular regulatory protein on the open chromatin. And you can do similar things in principle to find changes on gene expression and ultimately understand how that relates to disease. Now, another kind of question we may want to answer is not just what are the individual genes that cause ALS, but what are the pathways? Because if we discover that there are thousands and thousands of variants out there that modestly increase someone's risk of ALS, it's going to be hard to figure out how you turn that information to therapeutics. But it may be, and this is something we've seen in cancers, that could be lots of susceptibility genes that all drive common pathway changes. And maybe we can develop drugs to the changes in the pathway and not have to worry about developing a drug to the maybe tens or hundreds of genes that individually cause those alterations in the same pathway. And so this is work that Karen Sachs, who's an expert in probabilistic graphical models, has been doing to try to take statistical relationships among the genes, among the proteins in these data sets, and try to identify those altered pathways. 
And then the final thing I want to mention is uh, we're very interested in trying to understand how many types of ALS there are. And one thing you can do is try to look at the clinical data that's been gathered. So the ALS FRS score is uh, our information about uh, the functional uh, rating scale, how much, uh, what can patients do at various times. And we know uh, clinically that there are fast and slow progressors. And so Divya, with, uh, working with the AI team uh, at IBM, has been examining ways to understand these data. We know, for example, uh, from the literature and from our own data, these are our own data, that there are certain mutations that are associated with fast progression. We see in our own data that C9 patients, the ones in uh, cyan, uh, tend to have a faster rate of progression in the disease than the ones that are grayed out um, that, uh, that occur at slower rates as well. But it's not all that predictive for, uh, for the average patient. And so we want to try to understand this with our own data. Now, our own data are sparse. Um, uh, patients are in the answer ALS study for a limited amount of time, and by its nature, this rating scale is not um, that accurate, so there is a certain amount of noise in these data sets. And so we need to come up with ways to make sense out of these short um, views into a patient's life, uh, what is their overall trajectory in the disease. And so uh, Divya developed an approach to dealing with this. And so we can take this uh, complicated data set shown here for answer or less and divide it up into groups that have particular patterns of progression uh, through time. And so each one of these colors shows you a range of patterns that, um, that patients can uh, go through. And one of the striking things here is the diversity of these patterns. And in particular, um, there are patterns that uh, show uh, patients who uh, slowly uh, progress and then undergo a period when they progress more rapidly. And some of these, again, plateau out again later. So we're very interested in trying to understand if, uh, what exactly is going on here. There's also a point that's really important here that um, what you see at the beginning of the disease is not necessarily predictive of what's going to happen across uh, the time of the disease. And so a lot of studies uh, have been looking at the initial slope of patients and characterizing slow and fast progression based on initial slope. But if you do that for this group of patients, and uh, in dark blue is shown one specific patient, but there are many others who follow this general pattern, the initial predicted slope uh, is not informative about what's actually happening uh, after a period of time passes. And so one of the things that uh, Divya is doing now is taking patients that fall into different groups here and trying to examine in all of the different kinds of omic data that you heard about whether there are signals that tell us whether a patient belongs to one group or the other. Okay, so what should you expect in the coming year? Well, first of all, there will be a lot more data. And with more data becomes more opportunities to reach uh, statistical significance in these uh, various approaches that we've taken uh, to analyzing the problem. Uh, we'll see lots of improvement for, to the portal. Uh, as I said, it's being supported by a very generous gift from Microsoft to help us uh, make this uh, the best possible portal. But we also need your help, so go use the portal, break it, tell us what's broken, there's a feedback form, and we'll use that information to inform the next generation. And then one of the things we're really all very uh, focused on here is to try to get out some scientific publications because most scientists are not Googling to try to find new data sets. They go to literature and the best reason to examine a data set is that someone else found something scientifically important in it. And so if we can publish more papers about what we found, that'll bring a lot more researchers uh, to the front uh, to work on this. And with that, I'll close. Thanks so much, Ernest. Um, our final talk of this morning's session is from Jeffrey Rothstein, Johns Hopkins University. And the title of his talk is Answer ALS, a powerful resource for the future of ALS research. Thanks, Emily. So I'm gonna close out this section really by uh, giving you much more of an overview. You've heard uh, tidbits of exciting science that's coming from this superb team and a little bit of this is, uh, is cycling back to the very beginning, what Merritt taught us and told us about. The core mission of Answer ALS is really to help understand what causes ALS and eventually to find therapy. So it's, that's what all of us that do, uh, that attempt to do as clinician scientists. And we've learned over the years that we haven't done such a good job in translating our science to patients, in part, perhaps because we've been treating sporadic ALS as one single disease. And it may very well be that we will find therapies uh, that work in sporadic. But lessons learned from cancer, as many of you know, are that th even though you might have breast cancer or prostate cancer, there are many different molecular events that underlie these uh, similarly appearing cancers. And that knowing those 
specific molecular events allows us to optimize therapy and really to make a huge difference in cancer, and we certainly hope to do the same thing in ALS. And this is actually happening now, as many also know, as we attempt to treat some of the inherited forms of ALS, where we have some very exciting therapies uh, underway. Um, and so answer was really much more about how do we do the same for sporadic disease, where as clinicians we know there really are very different forms of the disease clinically, and we really need to understand those subtypes. And the only way to do that, of course, really is to dive into the biology. And you've heard the term biopsies because um, most in the audience may know, but those on Facebook may not know, that it's, uh, we can't do biopsies the way we can in cancer. We can't biopsy the skin or heart or liver. We can do that easily in cancers. We can't do that of the brain or spinal cord. And to, that, to, to change that um, approach, we relied on what Clive taught us about, which is the use of iPS cells, essentially a virtual biopsy of someone's nervous system by creating from their stem cells, brain cells, or in this case, spinal cord cells. And you've seen again this slide of this very elaborate, uh, although well-working and well-greased machine where we're moving from the patient, patients from around the country now to the creation of that, that large uh, body of biopsies. And you just heard from Ernest how, with the help of uh, Leslie and Steve, uh, we're beginning to amass that data so we can begin to ultimately find those subgroups as sort of cartooned eyes on this slide. And so again, the ultimate goal of ANSWER is to take all of that data and to really eventually, in a cliche way, find the right drug for the right patient, the way we really do quite uh, frequently now in cancers. And so we've now as a group um, begun to amass large quantities of these cells We've begun to generate large volumes of data. We have large amounts of biofluids from our patients, blood samples, more than 50,000 blood samples that are saved. Um, and we even have unusual and novel data from patients' voice, which is you'll hear more about uh, tomorrow and how that becomes an incredible predictor for patients actually who can't come to the clinic anymore and will be able to use this uh, to follow their progression and hopefully in clinical trials simplify some of our future clinical trials. So this slide uh, in, a, in sort of a complex way uh, summarizes um, the various domains that we have of, of biological and information samples. So we have the IPS lines, we have um, our biosamples in the Niels Biosuppository, Neurobank holds our clinical data, we have now app data stored as well. And all of this data has come together in large data sets that Ernest just revealed to you, um, now stored on, on a cloud with the great help of Microsoft uh, to gather our data. And ultimately, all of this, although we are now trying internally to work with this data, again, Ernest has revealed some of what we're trying to do, we're not the only players in trying to attempt to understand ALS. This is a great team to pull all of the data together, to bring our patients around the country together, but this is not a problem that's likely to be solved just by this team. And to make sure that we can have this data available to others who have novel approaches to ALS, novel ideas of using our tools. And when I refer to tools, I'm really referring to the fact that these IPS cells, this biopsy, is usable around the world. We've now built this uh, a portal. It's our first stage of a portal, a way to get data to patients around the world. Now, to ensure that this data is not used just by us, and you're hearing about the first steps, you're gonna hear more about this this afternoon and tomorrow about how internally we're trying to use it. We don't wanna sort of do our own work and then give it to the rest of the world to work on. We wanna do this in parallel. And to do that, we have really, as I mentioned, uh, established a portal. Some of that data is going out. I'll show you that in just a second. But we're already beginning now to talk to other agencies who can help us do this. Now, these are not finalized contracts, but we know we can't do this alone. Uh, we're, this is a great team that's working together, but we really need the help of, of really worldwide resources. So we're in discussions with other nonprofits in the government. We're in discussion with ALSA. We're in the discussion with NIH to help us help them provide this data really to researchers around the world. One early initiative, and these are initiatives that are not yet finalized, uh, working with ALSA is uh, an, um, a way of putting the data as a competitive analysis with um, as listed here with Kaggle, uh, to really find out ways in which researchers around the world might access this data to um, challenge them to understand what we're finding. 
We've had discussions with the Chan Zuckerberg Neurodegeneration Initiative, and there's actually others out there who are equally interested in what we do in ALS. ALS, although it's a motor neuron disease, we, many of us that wear clinical hats know that there's a dementia component to ALS. Some patients have a very severe dementia, and for others it's a very mild. But it also means that the biology of ALS includes dementia, and therefore those organizations that work on dementia should be coupled to what we're doing, and in turn we need to be coupled to what they're doing, and those organizations and disease families include frontal temporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So we'll be starting discussions with those kinds of organizations, again, to get our data, to get other researchers to work with what we're doing. <clears throat> now, to be clear, everything about ANSWER was always about collaboration. First and foremost, this is about the patients, our patients not just at the centers involved here, but really patients around the world and certainly within the United States that have come and volunteered uh, their efforts, their time to help us understand the disease. And as you've seen on this, this first map, uh, that's patients initially localized sort of around, geographically around uh, the middle of the country and both coasts. We've had a great research team that's largely bi-coastal, as you can see on this map, working across the United States to work together. And most importantly, even though we're not done in any way with what we're doing, we've opened up our program very early on. As many know, this is an open source program. As we generate data, it's available. It, we're not waiting till we're done, till we publish our typical academic papers. This data is available now. And the last map gives you a sense of already how we're distributing this data around the United States, around the world to others. This is a collaborative effort from patients and researchers. And none of this is not, would be, with it would never be, nothing here would be possible if it wasn't really for the collaborative uh, effort of organizations and families who've come together to fund this effort. And this slide really shows you the many organizations that have been essential. This program could have never happened if it wasn't for the organizations listed on this slide. So everything about this is built on a foundation of those willing to invest their time, their effort outside of the research community to make this project happen. And with that, I'm going to end. This is the end of our, uh, the introductory program of what's going on. We're going to be going into, and Emily will tell you more about how we'll now start del delving into the individual projects where progress is being made, much more of the, uh, the deep science that we're carrying out. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Jeff. And actually, at this point, I'd like to invite all of this morning's speakers back up on the stage, and we're going to take some questions both from the room here and also I think we have compiled some of the questions that were coming in from Facebook, so we'll, we'll take a few minutes to run through those too. All right, so um, actually, Jeff, you may have already spoken to this, but the first question that came in was, are you waiting un until all the samples are processed before you start analyzing the data? Well, so I, didn't, I only, summer, in a summary, answered that. You actually heard from Ernest and Leslie that we are taking the data now. They, the internal team, if, if I can call them that, are now taking the data to analyze. But we actually know that others around the world are also taking our data and doing their own analysis as well. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, no, we're definitely analyzing as the sequences and as the assays come off. We're immediately analyzing. Well, one of the challenges with analyzing too deeply too early, it's really a, when do you start, because we've got rolling data coming in. Um, but I think in-term analysis, everybody should be able to do. And as we release it, I'm sure the community is going to analyze it as we go along as well. Just one other quick comment. Uh, one of the things that we are doing very heavily with the initial analysis, though, is to analyze the structure of the data itself. So now we're learning about the incorporation of the cell composition and other things that we need to be um, bringing in as, we, as people will be analyzing this data and providing the information we learn also to the community. I was going to say, I really liked what Ernest showed about the uh, language for the sharing and, and encouraging people who use the samples to share the data if they can, not required. But that would just make this even, even uh, uh, yeah, more amazing data set. Just to put a sort of a practical clinical way of looking at that, when you talk about um, how we're building a data set, 
on the clinical side, if you had two patients with ALS and you, you looked at their blood and samples and you tried to make a generalized observation about that, most of us would know that's not very good science. You need not two, maybe you need 20, maybe you need 200 or 1,000 to truly understand the disease. And that, from a practical way of how we look at patients, that's why this, we need so many different cell lines because the cell lines each represent an individual patient. So it's, we're building to that. We've analyzed, if you will, close to hundreds of cell lines and eventually we'll know if we need 200 or 100 is enough. Great, thanks. And the next question is, uh, how do you think this will help us to understand sporadic ALS? I think that's, that's one of the main goals of the study is to, uh, gives, this gives us a tool to study the biology in sporadic ALS, which we really haven't had before. You know, as Jeff mentioned, we can't actually biopsy the illness and we can't make animal models on the sporadic because we don't have a gene. And this is, is, is probably the best way to try to understand that biology. And specifically, the vision here is that by using the information, the molecular data that we gather from these living biopsies of the sporadic patients, we can identify the pathways that we might target, be able to target therapeutically. And there may be many different types of ALS patients, and so we're gonna find those different subtypes of sporadic ALS and find the pathways that could be targeted for each specific subtype, much as been, much like has been done in cancer. We ought to go to the third one. Okay, so the third one is definitely for Leslie. <laughs> What is an omic? And I think you addressed this somewhat in your talk, but at a really high level, can you give a sort of one sentence wrap up? What is omics? Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's a challenge. Um, I think it's, it's a snapshot of all the processes that are going on within a given cell. So whether it's from the DNA level to the RNA level to the protein level to the, the, all the metabolites. So all the everything that goes into the state, to creating a state of a given cell, and all the molecular and biochemical pieces that go into that, or molecular pieces that go into that. I'll try and, okay. you try. I'll try and use an analogy, if you're trying to describe how a car works. You, you use, there's, there's many different parts to a car. So you say, well, here's how the engine works, and that's an omic for the, I'm, I'm, maybe I just thought about this, so it's probably not the best. And then you've got the tires, and you've got you know, all the different pieces to a car, suspension. That, all those pieces fit together to make a cell work. And we're exploring each one of those independently through these omics. I don't know if that works. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. Good. <laughs> well done. Okay. And just to clarify, right, so it's a shorthand term that we use. So there are genomic data, information about your genome. And there's proteomic data about your proteins. And there's transcript omic data about the transcripts that are made from RNA. And so a shorthand that scientists like to say is we're talking about omics, all of those different molecular measurements. So there is no such thing as an individual omic. It's just a shorthand for all the different kinds of ways of measuring molecules in the cell and how they are altered. Great. And I think how you just handle that all together shows the team approach and the collaboration that underlies this whole effort. <laughs> all right. Uh, the next question is for Merit. And how will this work together with the Mass General, the Healy Platform Trials? Thank you. This is much easier than answering what an <laughs> omic is. Uh, I, there's two immediate ways. Um, and so the first one is that in the platform trial, we're also, um, uh, besides trying to screen drugs and find drugs that work, we're also trying to learn about the biology of the illness in the same way ANSWER is. So we've partnered with ANSWER so that um, the people who are part of the platform trial are also giving us similar clinical data as in uh, ANSWER, uh, similar biofluids and also uh, eventually, uh, and we're fundraising for this, uh, the PBMC so that we can, um, in a way, have another set of data should we need more from ANSWER. So they're linked that way uh, scientifically. Um, the second way, which I think is kind of in the future, is that the, the data that come from ANSWER on different um, biologies and targets will lead to treatments and ways to personalize treatments that will then be fed into the platform trial as well. So that's more in the future. The immediate is the, really the sharing of the clinical and fluids. I want to add to that. So the platform trial, to many of us, is an incredibly exciting way that we can advance, and, and Merit will go over that more, and has gone over it, um, patients' trials. But it's not the only way. There are many companies out there that are just do things independent, which is fine, uh, big pharma often. This data is not used just by small biotechs or academics. It's available to other companies, and there are other large 
uh, companies already in discussions with us about the data. Now, data doesn't mean it's a trial yet, but the point is this is a, this is a data set that's usable worldwide, not just in the U.S. European companies and European academic investigators may also use it eventually to bring up drugs. So we have this incredible novel way of approaching ALS, but this is a tool and a set of data available for really worldwide to others. I'm going to skip ahead one question because I think uh, the next one then follows really directly from what we were just discussing. How will answer ALS data impact all ALS research? In some trials, uh, some are improving and some are not. Will answer ALS help understand this? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll let Jeff answer how an, answer ALS will impact all of ALS research. That's a big question. But I do think uh, that's a key point, that there are some, um, in, in some studies, we do anticipate that some people will respond better, and we don't have the tools now to figure that out or to um, a priori figure that out, and that's what answer is going to help us, uh, help us figure out. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Merit. From that end, it, it's going to be extremely useful in terms of all ALS research, I don't think any of us truly know that answer. It's the largest data set. We have great hope that it will impact ALS research, especially in terms of sporadic ALS. And I think the most important part of everything that we're doing is that it really is open source, that whatever we may find, um, others will go well beyond what this, even though it's a great team, we're a small team compared to the world of ALS researchers. And we hope that it will be usable by all of those around the world. Make one other comment. Uh, we just had the Packard meeting right before this, and I think one of the things that came out also is to um, learn from Answer ALS as well. Some of the structures we put in place, the way we're approaching metadata, as you heard about, ways we're approaching the quality control and the way that things are structured is also um, going to be applied to some of the other research that's going to be going on in the ALS field so that all of us together can utilize data that's sort of harmonized, that's, that's more consistent across the different groups. So I think it's also helping at a very fundamental research level as well. Great, thanks. Um, Ernest, maybe you can take this next question. Given that we now know what anomic is, what do you learn from these cells? There, there are many things that we're learning from these cells. Fundamentally, the biggest goal is, as I've said, to try to use the information from the cells to identify groups of sporadic patients who have something wrong with them that is common to that group and different from the other groups. If we can find out those things that are wrong at the molecular level in some group of ALS patients, then we can try to develop a therapy for that. And that's been very, very successful in cancer. So if you think about breast cancer, one of the most common kinds of cancer, there's not one drug that applies to all breast cancer patients. You need to know specifically what kind of subtype. So we're going to try to find the subtypes of ALS. Uh, it's going to be in the molecules, right? The answer to this is going to be something, some group of proteins that are changing their function between the patients who have the disease and the rest of the population. Clyde. I was just going to add to any results from the data yet. I, I think what I briefly mentioned is, was fascinating to me because we weren't looking for anything, but the, the two groups that popped out, and we realized what they were afterwards, and we thought, oh, that's exciting. Is it ALS and control? And it wasn't. It was all mixed. There was ALS and control in both of these subgroups, and it was male, female. And it turns out that y, you know, X, we have different genes, and so we don't know what that means yet, but it tells us our, our data analysis is bringing out subgroups. <laughs> that's the first subgroup. Um, and there are others in there as we get more and more into the data that Ernest discussed. We are going to find other subgroups. It's just more complicated than male-female where there's a chromosome difference. And that, there should be a subgroup of male-female. And I think what this is going to do for sporadic, which people avoid sometimes in the, in the field, you look at C9, SOD1, because all the animal models. For me, it's the sporadic that's really the key, that we're going to start learning about sporadic ALS. It's not going to be left out. Uh, and I think that's really important. Yeah. Um uh, not this morning, but this afternoon, I think. Um, we'll see some data specifically about sporadic. Whether it's a tractable, druggable target, time will tell. But we will see subgroup data about sporadic that's coming out. And it's coming out um, not necessarily yet because of all the omics that Ernest and Leslie are doing, but because we actually have the tools. We have so many different patient cell lines that we now have a sampling of patients that we'd never had before in this very powerful tool, the iPS neurons. Again, in most published studies in academics, they have been you know, one or two, three, 
cell lines, meaning one or two, three patients. That's just, that's just too small. It's nonsense. Today we have hundreds. Now, we can't work with hundreds yet, but we certainly can work with a dozen or more. And now we're getting a better handle of differences among sporadic patients with these living cells. Great, thanks. And the final and uh, seemingly most important question is, how can I get one of those cool hats <laughs> into the audience? Well, obviously, Great. that's what I want to know, because, <laughs> because I don't have one. Um, if you don't know, uh, we're having a gala in two weeks and one day, and uh, that's where you'll get one of those hats. And we may make those available afterwards, and particularly when you guys are solving ALS. We'll pass them out to everyone. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, a any questions from the room? GWAS? So the question was, uh, when I showed a slide of different kinds of genes, Mendelian genes and GWAS. So GWAS stands for Genome-Wide Association Study. And it's a statistical method that's used quite commonly now uh, when you have a lot of genomic data to try to find variations in the genome that are statistically associated with something. So uh, with, say, an increased risk of diabetes or, or something else, right? And so similar approaches can be applied to any disease. Um, and those variants that are discovered in genome-wide association studies tend to be associated with a modest increased risk of disease as opposed to something like a C9 variant, which is associated almost invariably with disease. Yes, go ahead. Here. Um, the other one, I was wondering when we were talking about this, this study and the uh, patient acknowledgement of their um, genetic typing, the other chromosome, that, um, first of all, has there been any interesting or, I should say, life-saving important intervention from somebody finding out what they might be carriers for? Or maybe that's a HIPAA question and you Yeah, that's know. a HIPAA question. Okay, fine. So you don't know that. Or you do, but whatever. But then what I was wondering is, you also said that that was um, a novel um, approach to having set up the system, and I'm wondering if that then has been published or there's a way of acknowledging the research and the work done with that, not in any way to give credit to us, but just that it becomes standard, and how has that become standardized? Um, so uh, the first answer to that is that we are working on a publication. We can never guarantee timing of a publication completion and submission to a journal, but that's actively in work, being worked on. The other side is that all of us go to meetings. Almost everyone, I think, here has talked about Answer ALS in various different meeting formats. So the F Parkinson's family knows the meeting. The community knows about what we're doing. Um, the frontotemporal dementia community knows what we're doing. That is, other disease communities, whether they're small meetings we've gone to or very large neuro, neuro, uh, typical neurology or basic neuroscience meetings. So we're communicating what we're doing. In the academic world, ultimately, it's still ultimate uh, publication that gets the word out more widely. Great. Yeah. Um, I've got a question because I know that um, you've been gathering information on environmental factors. And since the focus was some of the patterns that are emerging appear to be related to sporadic ALS, I'm wondering what mechanisms are in place to overlay those environmental factors with that analysis. Yeah, so, the, you know, so absolutely that clinical data is, is in the same data sets and can be uh, merged. I, I'll leave the math to, to, uh, um, to the, the MIT folks. But it's, it's, it's part of the data set that can be looked at. I'm not sure that if how deeply it's been looked at yet. And we've also collaborated with the CDC so that our questions are somewhat aligned. It's not as, as deep as theirs, but the, there's overlap. And then from the cell side, if we found an environmental agent that was coming, cropping up with a group of patients, let's say, you know, lived in a coal mine, or lived, <laughs> worked in a coal mine, um, and that those, and there was a group of patients who were susceptible. I don't know, we could think of putting coal dust on the cells. You know, we could try and relate it to the environmental factors. You know, ultimately, that could be a way of doing it. So, so the only thing I'll add, though, is that environmental influences on ALS have been well studied over decades. 
I'm not dismissing that, but it's never been studied in the context of having this kind of biological data. So having that data now coupled might illuminate something or might not. I don't think any of us know yet, but the, it's the integration of the clinical data with the biological data ultimately will potentially bring out any of those factors in what we call in sort of an unbiased way. where We don't really know, will those two come together? We don't know any of that yet. Very impressive uh, uh, presentation with you guys. Um, very informative. Um, so with the National Illness Biorepository, we collect six, fo six files of blood from our patients. You guys need a thousand stem cell lines, I believe it is. Is that correct from your presentation? We can certainly help you guys out. With our six files of blood, we also use GUID as well. We'd be happy to share four to five milliliters of blood with you guys to go ahead and generate those lines. So one, I thank you for your willingness to collaborate. We've actually enrolled over a thousand okay, patients already. Okay. And we collected that. That doesn't mean we wouldn't want to do something in the future, especially sure, if we wanted sure. to test hypotheses. But we've had a fantastic response from the ALS patient community uh, nationwide. Uh, and that's allowed us to go, Merritt showed you that graph. Absolutely. That's the fastest enrolling ALS trial, I think, ever. Um, and um, so the good news is we have those patients, Wonderful. we have those materials, but we definitely appreciate the opportunity to go beyond this as we generate more data and then see if we need to then test some of this in other data sets. Absolutely. I mean, we, we share some synergies as well, like I said, the GUID, the questionnaires as well. And so certainly, I think in the future, I think collaborations could be, could, could be in the works. Great. So. Hi, this is a question for Claire for communications and outreach. So uh, very important, I just wanted to ask, have you, we've, they've mentioned so much today about how we want to get people to know more about the data and using it. Have you looked into LinkedIn, for example, as a means to getting this data out? Just as a quick example, currently, sadly, the coronavirus is going on. Uh, in the data science community right now, there are people every day uploading like GitHub repositories with data and saying, hey, you know, do these analyses, do this, do that. And they're getting hundreds of thousands of views, big people in the data science community, because the LinkedIn data science community is very, um, it, it's, a, it's a very close-knit place, and it's, there's a lot of traction there. It's interesting you said that. We just connected with uh, uh, Peter and Ed tasked us with uh, developing a community strategy for the data because one of the things I was going to talk about today was data is not sexy. It's not something we can just go to the media and say, hey, we've got this really great data set, you know, put it on the Today Show. It just doesn't happen. So finding, um, <coughs> accessing things like LinkedIn and those resources are really what we're looking for. Um, and I alluded to Peter and Ed challenged us with this. We found a group who did a huge project with Accenture. And so they're helping us strategize in terms just like that because it's really not in our lane. And I don't think many people understand how to do this in a way that's you know, biological in nature and not uh, really fun data like how many people wreck their bikes in a neighborhood. Don't, don't worry, most of us are at work and don't watch the Today Show. <laughs> well, that was going to be my point. It's, uh, you know, it may not be sexy to the Today Show, oh. but to bioinformaticists, it's extremely sexy, <laughs> exactly which is worrying but also true, right? Yeah. So. The, the, goal is to, the goal is to get it to the right audience, and I think that's a great idea, Yogi, is to get it into that where you get a frenzy of downloads, and I think it's a really good idea, and we should be cognizant of getting it to that right audience. Uh, the Today Show is great for fundraising and, and getting the, the notes, but uh, just so data is. I think we have time for one last set, uh, question. Uh, a quick question for uh, Merit for the ROAR program where we're returning uh, information back on their genetic test. Yes. Uh, have the patients been um, uh, sort of consented in a way so that there's a list of uh, people where they can kind of say, yes, I have a first mutation and put me on this list so that you know, when it's, someone wants to come in with a therapeutic intervention or Biogen wants to know who has SOD1 mutations, uh, could, how do they get access or how are they connected? Uh, uh, so, good question. Yes, they are. Uh, there is a part of the consent where they are um, able to be contacted about other research studies, so they can say yes or no if they're willing to uh, be recontacted okay. for other and, things. And the companies then have access to that list, so that they know that. They, or do, do not they the come, companies. Do they no. come through? NCRLS they will work with their or? physicians, with their uh, local site physicians. Oh, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, Just to be clear, companies have access to the data. Everyone has access to the data, but now you're digging into a separate sort of bin of, of kinds of data. So they have access to the raw uh, omics data or the clinical data, which is uh, um, 
protected, HIPAA protected with a GOID, but not that kind of data. I'll just follow up though. So they have access to genomic data. They are barred by their data use agreement from trying to identify the patients. So just to be clear to everybody who's trying to participate in the study, you will not be identified. We have made it very clear to anybody who uses the data that they're not allowed to try to re-identify patients. For clinical trials, you can go back to those subsets, right? Right. So patients can give permission for their own, you know, their doctor and the site to contact them about research studies, which, which almost everybody agrees to. Great. All right. Well, I'd like to thank all of our speakers from this morning. That was really wonderful. Thanks again.